Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for, for coming along today and uh, for making our, our first ever breakfast with the experts uh, a sellout. We've still got a handful of people that are uh, on their way. Uh, hopefully, we'll see them soon. So um, I don't just want to thank you for coming. I want to congratulate you for coming because um, in investing to come along today and learn these uh, tax secrets, I think you, you effectively are saying that you're in that tiny proportion of the population that wants to invest in their financial education, their financial future. Um, and it's great that you know, you've taken this opportunity and we're really delighted to, to have you along today. Uh, my name's Graham Rowan. I'm going to be effectively the sort of master of ceremonies. I'll, I'll do the first speaking slot and then I'll introduce the other speakers. So let me just run through what we've got lined up for you this morning, um, and hopefully you'll uh, agree it's going to be a, a brilliant session. We want to introduce you to three areas of tax where you have the potential to save tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of pounds on individual transactions and across multiple generations of your family if you set things up in the right way. Obviously, in, in a fairly brief session like this, you know, the, the speakers all wanted like 90 minutes each. And I said, we, we ain't got that. You've got 20 minutes. So they're going to scratch the surface of some pretty significant topics. But then we've got a really clear way forward for you to take it on. If it looks to be of interest to you, uh, you can go forward with that in more detail to look at uh, your own circumstances. Um, obviously, we could talk about tax all day, um, but we felt that might be a bit too much excitement for you. So we, we thought instead we'll actually take you out for some drives in the cars around the test track. So uh, once we've done the talks, uh, by about 10 o'clock, uh, we're going to go out there. We've got two dedicated cars and drivers, and they'll be taking us for a, a whiz around the track. We also want to give you some uh, extra thank yous for coming. Uh, in front of you, you'll have one of these packs, which has got um, some handouts in it. We'll also send you a copy of the material afterwards. So don't worry about frantically scribbling lots of notes. Um, you will be getting a copy of all the slides emailed to you. Um, one of the things I produce is a monthly newsletter called Wealth Watch. You've got the current issue in your pack here, and you'll start getting that uh, free of charge every month from now on. There's a, a copy of a book I published last year called The French Property Secret. It's about a, a little-known form of French real estate investment that you might find of interest. Uh, one of our speakers is Tim Coe, and you'll see a copy of his Skeptic's Guide to Saving Thousands in Stamp Duty is also enclosed in there. Um, Daphne should have been giving you some certificates, which I think themselves have a face value of about £1,000. There's a, a one-hour consultation with Alan James, who you'll hear from in a moment, Tim Coe and Peter Legg. There's also some uh, credit check vouchers if you want to uh, check out uh, some companies or suppliers. Uh, there'll be £250 towards your conveyancing fees if you decide to use Tim's services on your next house move. Credit checks on companies and prospects from Alan James. And as you can see, we're recording the event, so we're going to do some video highlights for you so you can again capture the, uh, uh, the essence of it and look at it again at your leisure in the future. So that's all either with you today or coming to you after the event. In terms of the schedule, let me just put my little timer on so I don't run over. Um, I'm going to talk in a minute about why we're all wealth managers now and why that really matters and what we're going to learn about today is important. Um, I'm then going to hand over to Alan James, who's going to talk about how you can save a fortune on tax, both personal and company tax. And then obviously now that you've got all that extra money, you want to do something with it. Well, perhaps you're going to buy a nice big house and Tim's going to tell you how you can avoid paying stamp duty on that house and save yourself another mint of money. Um, and once you've got that nice big house, you want to look after it for you and your family in the future. So Peter Legg's going to talk about things like putting that in trust, minimizing inheritance tax bills, and all, all that kind of stuff as well. So three key areas where you can save money, uh, whether you're uh, a business owner, whether you're an employee, employee, or whether you're a home buyer, these things are relevant to everybody. And then it's uh, after that, if you haven't already, we need to just get you to sign a little indemnity form for Mercedes-Benz. And then, essentially, although I've talked about two groups here, it's slightly less formal than that, what's going to happen is they're going to give you a time, roughly, as to when your circuit ride will be. Um, and it's a case of just basically being downstairs at that time. And the rest of the time, uh, you're free to look around the amazing facility here. 
And every time I come here, they've done something new. They've got three or four Formula One cars around the corner, an exploded version of the Mercedes car with every part hanging from the ceiling. Um, they've got old cars, new cars, and uh, lots and lots of stuff to see here. So the idea is that we'll be finished by 11.30, but obviously once you've had your ride, you're, you're free to go at that point, so that there'll be no further event happening after you've actually had the ride. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Is everyone at the right event? Yes. <laughs> just worth checking. Okay, so what I want to do is just a few minutes on why we're all wealth managers now and why it matters. Um, if you look at me, you'll see my sort of thinning gray hair, you'll see my lined and wrinkled face. I have been around the block a few times. Um, and I think the most important financial lesson I've learned in that time is it ain't what you make that matters, it's what you keep. And there are all sorts of forces that will try to separate you from the money that you make. And the history books are full of uh, pop singers, football players, lottery winners, and you know, business owners who've made a fortune and lost a lot, mainly through a lack of financial education and mainly through not getting the right advice from the right people. So a key uh, underlying principle of what we're doing today is to say, look, there are people out there who can help you to hang on to your money if you know who they are and you get in touch and you use them. Because I talked about the forces that are trying to take our, our wealth away, and one of the main forces is, is what I call confiscation by tax. Um, if you have any sort of income or assets, you might as well paint a great big target on your chest because HMRC are coming after you. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but what they call Tax Freedom Day is now May the 29th. From the 1st of January to the end of May, everything we earn basically goes to HMRC in one way or another. So, you know, it used to be in April, then it was the start of May. You know, any guesses for where it's going next? It won't be long before we're working the majority of the year for the tax man. And the, the thank you we get for that is that there are new hit teams being formed to come after people, whether it's expats, whether it's people with overseas bank accounts. Every month, HMRC thinks of some new little niche it can go for creates a hit team and goes after those individuals. Whether it's for PAYE, I, I was one subject to a PAYE investigation. It took 18 months. Um, had I not had a certain kind of insurance in place, it would have cost me thousands in accountants and lawyers' bills. At the end of 18 months, they found there was one month of benefit in kind on health insurance for, for 52 quid that I haven't paid. And so, you know, that's the sort of thing that happens. This was 10 years ago. It's even worse now. Um, if you've ever been subject to one of those investigations, they're not fun. Um, you can actually take out insurance against them at quite modest cost, and I would certainly recommend that. Um, Barclays Bank. I never thought I'd be championing and defending Barclays Bank, but one of the things that happened earlier this year was the government retrospectively changed some legislation which actually led to a three or four billion pound tax bill for Barclays Bank. Uh, you know, I, I expect Robert Mugabe to do retroactive law changes. I don't expect our own government to do it, but that's how far they're prepared to go. And a, a, a comment that George Osborne made in his budget speech this year, I think is typical of the approach they're now taking. He said, tax evasion and aggressive avoidance are morally repugnant. Now, Tim's gonna pick up on this a bit more later, but. What he's trying to say there is illegal tax evasion and legal tax avoidance are the same thing. That's like saying breaking the law and not breaking the law is the same thing. It's complete rubbish, but it's deliberately designed to blur the boundaries to make people worried about legitimate tax avoidance schemes. So we have to be realized that you know, this is what's going on and, and, and deal with it accordingly. And I was amazed that our prime minister thought it was okay to step out of a G8 conference in Mexico and comment on the personal tax affairs of a stand-up comedian. Sometimes I think, you know, maybe if David Cameron and Jimmy Carr swapped jobs, we'd actually be better off. <laughs> so the second form of confiscation is what I call confiscation by stealth. Um, you may or may not know that until 1971, currencies like the dollar and, by implication, sterling, were linked to gold. 
and you had to have a certain amount of gold in the vault for every new pound note you created. Well, Richard Nixon changed all that in 1971, and there's been two impacts from that. That released politicians from any discipline when it came to creating money, so they just started the printing presses rolling 24-7, and the red line shows you the increase in the money supply in that time. And surprise, surprise, the jagged white and green line is the remnants of a pound note, and it's gone down 95% in value. Its purchasing power has gone down 95% in those 40 years. So that means that it, it's great for governments because they pay last year's debts with next year's worthless currency. But it's terrible for savers and investors if they've got a lot of cash because the purchasing power of that cash is going down all the time. So you'll see the, the, the manipulated inflation figures that talk about 2 or 3%. I don't know about you, but my costs have certainly been going up a lot more than 2 or 3%. If something gets too high, they simply take it out of the measurement. So it's not the CPI, it's the CP lie. Um, so you've got to be aware that your wealth is being confiscated in this deliberate way. Um, Mervyn King's been a busy boy this year. He's, he's created 156 billion bouncing baby new pound notes. And of course, he's added absolutely nothing to our real economy. So all we've done is make that red line go up even more steeply, chasing the same underlying wealth and assets, and therefore further devaluing the pound in your pocket, as Mr. Wilson used to say. Just to say a few words about myself, um, I'm a speaker, an author, an investor, a business owner. I tend to uh, have this kind of Marmite reaction with people. As you've already heard, I'm not too shy in coming forward with my views, and that, that puts some people off and it attracts others. So, uh, I, sh I shan't apologize, that's how I am. Um, I'm kind of pro-business, free enterprise, personal responsibility. I'm anti-big government, nanny states, compensation cultures, entitlement cultures, and most of all, I think, political correctness. Um, I'm involved in the two, I suppose, biggest crises facing the country today, the obesity epidemic and the pensions crisis. Uh, I sometimes think the government strategy is that they're going to cancel each other out, that we'll all get so fat, we'll die young, and we won't need a pension. So on the obesity side, I run a chain of uh, weight loss clinics called Weight Medics. Um, I'm chairman of the Obesity Management Association, and I'm uh, MD of a company called Food Advisors. In January, we're launching a campaign in Parliament called My Weight, My Future, which is all about trying to get people to take ownership of their weight issues and seek the best available help, because a lot of people just um, you know, don't do that. Um, on the financial side, obviously more relevant today, I run a company called Wealth Invest. Um, essentially, I look for extraordinary investments that you don't find on the high street. I do my own due diligence on them. I meet the management teams. I look at the, the whole sort of trading record and the investment performance. If I like it, I put my own money into it, and at that point, I tell my readers about it through things like the Wealth Watch newsletter, through special reports, seminars, events like this, and so on. Um, so I, I end up acting as a wealth coach for savvy investors who don't just follow the crowd. And, and I suppose the line on the bottom here summarizes what I try to do, which is to help people turn income into long-term wealth. So an important question I've got for you is, um, who do you take advice from? Because if you've ever watched Little Britain, the Marjorie character on there is only a slight exaggeration. It always amazes me how many of us will take slimming advice from fat people, but equally how many will take financial advice from poor people. Um, now I've been practicing what I preach and I'm going to talk to you about for something like 20 years. And the result of that is I've now got a, a seven-figure portfolio that's made up of roughly three equal parts. Uh, my properties in the UK and France, my businesses, and my investment portfolio, which is historically in all the usual stock market stuff, unit trusts, investment trusts. But I've taken more personal ownership of that in recent years. I've also gone in for what you might call alternative investments, things like forestry, gold bullion, silver bullion, uh, collectibles, and so on. So um, that's changed over the years. But the point is that you know, I've already achieved some degree of success in what I'm going to talk to you about. So I think an important question to ask is, is you know, what's your wealth plan? Um, you know, is it winning the lottery? I believe the last time I looked, the chances were 14 billion to one. 
Um, maybe it's premium bonds, better, better odds but lower prices, or maybe it's, it's divine intervention. But the, uh, the thing is, it is important to have a wealth plan, and preferably a written down wealth plan. And one of the reasons is one little letter in the alphabet has changed everything in the last 15 or 20 years. Until about 15 or 20 years ago, most people were in what were called DB pensions, defined benefit pensions, which meant that even before you retired, you knew what you were going to get. It was typically a percentage of your salary. It would be index linked to inflation. Uh, and you knew effectively what was coming. And there was a kind of golden generation that worked for large companies between the 50s and the 80s who retired with these kind of pensions to the golf course and lived happily ever after. Well, that's all changed. We now have what are called DC pensions, which are defined contribution pensions. So the only thing you're certain about is how much you put in. And you could spend your whole life contributing to a DC pension, and then a month before you want to retire, there's another 1929 Wall Street crash, and you could lose 30, 50, 70 percent of your savings overnight. And we've had no training in how to do this. This was kind of introduced uh, in, back in the 80s, and it's sort of without a great big fanfare, no one said, right, we'd better train you now because you're all looking after your own financial future. So effectively, we've all become wealth managers. Um, there are professionals you can go to, but if you look at their performance, 80% um, of professional fund and money managers struggle to beat the market. You know, you could put everything into a, a FTSE tracker fund and probably get similar or better performance than some of the so-called active professional managers. So the, the, the conclusion I've come to from that is that nobody cares about my family's financial future as much as I do. They've all got their own agenda, and I am not at the top of their agenda. So my only choice has been to take personal ownership, to invest in my own financial education, and to learn from the people who are doing it well already, and then to start you know, building up my own confidence and applying that uh, uh, into my own situation. So what I thought I'd do is give you three quick qualifications this morning, so you'll leave here with some, uh, some, some uh, written qualifications. Your O level in wealth management is to do exactly what you've done by coming today, which is to invest in your financial education. And I do worry, you may be aware, there's a big change going on at the moment in the way financial advisors work. It's called the Retail Distribution Review. And what it means is they're moving from broadly being commission-based <coughs> to being fee-based, which in, in, a, in a, uh, an intellectual way I think is a good idea because it means you're paying for good advice. But the reality is very few people have been in the habit of paying for financial advice. And I fear that when they, they introduce this fee-based system, a lot of people will simply say, oh, I don't want to do that, and they won't take any advice at all. It'll be interesting to see how that works out, but it's certainly been a, a, a sea change in the way that uh, financial services are managed. So again, I think the important point is take personal ownership. Invest in doing it yourself, do your own work, your own research, um, and then at least you know, you'll be in charge of making your own decisions. And then once you do that, you'll be ready for your A-level, which is to live within your means. No shit, Sherlock, you might say. Well, you know, we haven't been doing this as, as individuals or as a country for at least 15 or 20 years. Um, you know, everyone talks about the cuts. There are, there are strikes, there are protests about the cuts. Since the coalition came to power, the national debt has gone up by 32%. So whatever they're cutting, it ain't nearly enough. We're still living as a country way beyond our income. And it also applies at a personal level. And I think this is where perhaps the biggest challenge of wealth creation is, because it only works if you're prepared to take some delayed gratification. You know, what, what you see when Apple announces a new iPad or the new iPhone. You see the queues out the door. Everyone wanting to hand over 500 quid for that. Um, you know, it's when you face that choice. Do I go for the new iPhone or do I put some money into my, into my savings? That's the sort of tough choices that people are facing. Um, and you know, if you do spend everything you earn on <coughs> sex and drugs and rock and roll, you know, you're never going to be wealthy. It's as simple as that. And you've got to find a way 
um, of living within your means. Uh, one of the ways I've found which really works, and I'll be interested to see what your thoughts are on the psychology of this, and I'll give you this as homework, um, is to go and open a wealth account. Go to a bank that's not your normal bank and just say, I want to open an account, and then call it your name, wealth account. So this will be the, you know, the Peter Smith wealth account, the Judas Smith wealth account. Now, be aware, they'll treat you like a terrorist. They don't like strangers, so take your passport, 27 forms of ID, utility bills, CRB check, inside leg measurement, mother's maiden name, take all of that with you, and they might let you open an account. Then, and don't do it online either, do it in a physical bank in the high street. And then, avoid spending some amount of your net income. Now, if you're young, you'll probably get away with 10%. If you're my age, you're probably looking at more like 25 or 30%, because you, know, you need to make up for some lost time. And then, regularly, get in the habit of putting that money in your account. If you repeat that on a monthly basis, and what you'll do is, it's what I call the walk of wealth. Every month, you'll be walking down that high street to this bank for one reason only, to put a deposit into your wealth account. And as you see that get to 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 pounds, you will feel wealthy. And the psychological impact of that is enormous because A, it's habit forming, and B, it is genuinely increasing your wealth. Don't worry about interest rates, they're all terrible, but the money's not gonna be in there for long because once you've got to this stage, you qualify for your next qualification, this is the one that our education secretary has just brought over from Europe. It's your shiny new baccalaureate. And the baccalaureate in wealth management is to invest in real assets that hold their value. Now, I'm, I'm a glass half full kind of person. I don't want to be a harbinger of doom, but I believe there's some sort of financial meltdown coming at some point. Um, no country in history has ever been able to honestly repay this amount of debt. Broadly, there have been two choices. You either default, as countries like Russia and Argentina have done in a not very distant past. And in some ways, that's, that's a bit like you know, declaring bankruptcy as an individual. You just say, sorry, got no more money, can't pay. And it's very messy, and there's two or three very ugly years, but then you start again with a clean slate. I don't think that's what we're doing. I think we're going for plan B, which is kind of death by a thousand cuts, where we just keep on printing more and more and more money are devaluing the currency more and more and more. Because you know, we, we have what's called a fiat currency. Uh, somebody once told me that a fiat was an expensive Italian machine for heating up oil and then spreading it all over the road. I don't mean that kind of fiat. I mean a, a currency that's only backed by the government, by the say-so of politicians. There's no gold behind our currency. We just have the Bank of England and the Prime Minister and the Queen saying, trust us, we'll pay you. Uh, of course, we all trust our politicians, don't we? So, so I, I suspect that we can predict the currency will continue to devalue further, and therefore we need to be in physical assets that will hold their value. I touched on things like gold and silver, forestry, um, collectibles. There are all sorts of things you can be looking at that will do this, but you really need to make sure that that's what you're investing in. Um, obviously, there's been a lot to take in there, so I, I want to give you some early Christmas presents. Um, if you go to this website, wealthwatch.tv, you can register there to get the future issues of the newsletter. A report I've just written called Five Key Investments for the Next Decade. Uh, we'll email that to you after the event. And also, just in case it's of any value to you, a sort of a template wealth plan so that you can create your own uh, uh, plan going forward. So that's, if you like, why I think we need to do all this. So now let's get into uh, some of the specifics of how we can do that. And for that, um, I'm going to introduce Alan James. Now, he's not just an accountant, he's my accountant. Um, and I've known Alan for many years, and he's one of these people who's really passionate about helping his clients to minimize their tax bill uh, within the law. Um, a, lot of, a lot of accountants, in my experience, are like a sort of fourth emergency service. They, they do the basics. They'll get in touch with you one time of the year and say, you know, oh, you must get your company return and your tax returns due now, you know, and that's all you ever hear from them. Alan's much more proactive than that. Um, he's also a, a great networker. I've always found if I needed somebody who knew something about, you know, Lithuanian postage stamps or something, Alan knows the guy that will tell me. So <laughs> uh, don't forget to use him as a, as a great uh, 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 networker as well. So Alan, do you want to come and tell yes. us a bit about how to save a mint on tax? Yeah, thank you very much.
Thank you. Is it just, just that one? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Right. Um, well, good morning, everyone.